Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our second speaker of our robotics sem seminar series this semester. I miscounted. I thought he was the first, and I told him that he was going to start us off, but uh, I lied. Um, anyway, so today's uh, guest is Professor Dimitri Berenson. He is an associate professor from the electro sorry, let's try this. Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department at Michigan. Um, he did his bachelor's uh, at Cornell and his PhD at Carnegie Mellon, um, and then went on to do a postdoc at Berkeley. So his work now is in general purpose motion planning. He works on manipulation algorithms um, and how it relates to robotics uh, that interact with the environment and with the home and people and all that kind of stuff. So I'll let him take it away. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Norma. Okay, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's great to be able to participate in this seminar series. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, deformable object manipulation, but before I get to that, uh, for many people I know you're not experts in robotic manipulation, so I want to give you a quick state of the field um, uh, update. Uh, so in terms of robotic manipulation, the field has really had a common goal for many, many years, maybe arguably since the 60s, which is autonomous manipulation in homes, factories, hospitals, the environments where people uh, work and live. And the good news about this goal is that a lot of the hardware exists. Now, is this the best hardware? Are we done with hardware? Of course not. But capable hardware is out there right now, and you can buy it. So how come my robot isn't cooking my dinner and making my bed? The problem is the state of the software. So in industry, what you see is a lot of teleoperation. You see a lot of replaying of fixed command sequences, especially in factories, or executing pre-programmed behaviors, which are fairly simple. And if we're going to allow robots to work in these kinds of environments, we really need to improve our algorithms. Uh, specifically, we need algorithms that are going to be able to allow the robots to manipulate objects that they don't have much information about. Uh, they may never even have seen these objects uh, before in the world. And these objects may be uh, of many different kinds. They may be rigid. They may be deformable. They may even be uh, things like jello or fluids. So we need uh, algorithms that are capable of handling all of those. Now, of course, I'm not going to say that I can do all of that, but we are making progress, at least on the deformable object front. So why then do we focus on deformable objects? Well, one motivation is that, in practice, this is very, very important. So if you want to have a robot that helps you in your house, but it can't cook, it can't clean, it can't do the laundry, it can't make your bed, it can't help you get dressed if you're elderly or disabled, it's not going to be a very useful robot. So we need these capabilities to make these robots useful. Um, likewise, in agriculture uh, and in uh, healthcare, there's a lot of applications for deformable object manipulation, from inspection and harvesting to surgery, uh, doing things like just making beds in hospitals. How many hospital beds are made in the US alone every single day? They're all made by hand. How much hospital laundry is done every single day? And these people are loading the laundry into the machines by hand. So maybe if we can create robots that have these capabilities, we can help make these tasks more efficient uh, and require less labor. So that's the kind of story in terms of the practical application. Um, and while that's motivating, for me as a researcher, I'm really also very interested in the problem itself uh, being very difficult uh, to solve. Um, so, specifically, we have these three characteristics that make this problem difficult. The first is that you often have high model uncertainty. This, again, is because you may not, never have dealt with that specific object before. You may not even know how to model it well, even if you have seen it before. Uh, usually, they're uh, expensive to simulate, especially when there are a lot of constraints in the environment, obstacles, and so on. Um, deformable objects technically have infinite dimensional configuration spaces. That basically means that the number of degrees of freedom of the object is infinite. Uh, of course, we can discretize that to a reasonable number, but it's still going to be a very uh, large space to search. Um, and then also you have this problem that the system of manipulating a deformable object, let's say this piece of paper, is extremely underactuated, right? So I'm actuating my hand here, and I'm moving this corner of the object, and the rest of it complies with the motion. But I can't actuate a point right here directly, right? I, I can only actuate it through this very complicated chain. So that is a big problem for many robotics methods. Um, all, all three of these actually are. And what I want to argue is that we 
require a fundamentally different representation for how we plan for deformable objects than what we use for rigid objects. So we have to look at the kind of pick and place rigid body uh, paradigm that is very well established in um, motion planning and manipulation because it's very, very successful. And we have to move to a different paradigm so that we can do tasks like this, uh, covering up a, a table with a cloth, uh, for instance. Now, uh, how do people then model deformable objects? Uh, how do they simulate them? Well, uh, you shouldn't ask me. You should ask Dinesh because he's been doing this for many years and knows way more about it than I do. But I've read a few papers, and um, there are many different methods out there for simulating deformable objects. You have mass spring models, finite element methods, even some meshless methods. Uh, and uh, they're all very interesting, and uh, they're great applications of all of these for uh, simulation, surgical simulation, video games, movies, uh, and so on. But we're most interested in what can we use for robotics. And when we look at the robotic manipulation problem, we have some issues with what's uh, available. So first of all, a lot of these um, methods are benchmarked basically based on this is a visually realistic simulation. So if I'm playing a video game, do I really care that the clothes of the character are following the exact correct physics? Or do I just want something that kind of looks reasonable that helps me get immersed in the game? Right? So a lot of these are targeted towards visual realism. If we want to use this for robotics, that's not really what uh, we're going for. You also have some computational parameters, especially in finite element. And this is a, a big endeavor to, to do this right. Um, is how to discretize the object. If you discretize it incorrectly, or if you don't have an adapted, adaptive discretization, you can get very poor results. And if you do discretize it very, very finely, then the simulation is going to be quite slow. So this is quite challenging. Uh, and of course, there's the computation time aspect. So we're now at the point where we can do many simulations of deformable objects in real time, which is really great. Uh, but when you think about the robotics requirements, we want to simulate an action for the um, end effectors of the robot at a rate of maybe a thousand times per second, right? And that's still, uh, as far as I know, not within reach uh, in terms of these computation, uh, in these methods. Uh, now, that isn't to say that people haven't thought about how to use simulation for planning. In fact, there's been some great work on this, um, all the way from uh, you know this early work in uh, 2005 and 2006 to um, uh, even more recently, uh, this is from Peter Allen's group, where they're using a simulator to do trajectory optimization for folding cloth. Uh, and uh, these methods are effective, but they usually take a very long time to plan because of all of the simulation that needs to be done. And there's also the question of how you get the correct parameters to do uh, a simulation for a given object that you encounter. Um, there's also been work in local control for uh, deformable objects. And what I mean by local control is that we're trying to do some somewhat small adjustment of the object. It's almost at the right place, but we need to adjust it a little bit just to make it perfectly aligned with, let's say, a target feature that we want to hit there. Um, and there's been some work uh, here uh, from uh, Navarro Alicon's group in Hong Kong, uh, some early work uh, by me. And uh, this is actually more recent work uh, from Dinesh's group, again, that is using previous experience to uh, construct a feedback dictionary to um, <clears throat> basically uh, perform these local motions. And that's great. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about work that builds on uh, specifically these two up here. Um, but uh, I want to also convince you that this is not enough if we want practical deformable object manipulation. OK. so. What's our approach going to be then? If we're not really uh, going to simulate everything to high fidelity, what are we going to do? Well, I look at other, places, uh, other areas of robotics, and I look at what do people do when the system is too complicated to simulate and they need fast computation. And usually there's some kind of model reduction. And there is a great example of this in humanoid robotics. I don't know how many of you uh, watched the DARPA Robotics Challenge, where humanoid robots were walking around and manipulating things. And, uh, it was very exciting. I was happy to be a part of that. But what I learned is that you never deal with the whole robot at once. Right? When I'm trying to balance the robot, I don't care about what its fingers are doing. I even often don't care what its arms are doing. Right? When I'm trying to pick something up, I don't care what its legs are doing for the most part. And why do we do this? Wouldn't it be great if we could just automatically plan in the full you know, maybe 30-dimensional space of this humanoid robot? Uh, well, no, because that becomes a very hard planning problem. 
So what people do, uh, this is for the case of balancing, uh, is they come up with these very simplified models, like a rigid inverted pendulum or a car table model. And they have a way to map controls for this model to, let's say, stabilize this pendulum to controls for the full robot, so you stabilize the robot. And different models uh, are useful in different contexts, so we shouldn't expect one of these to ever be as good as the full true dynamics of the robot, but they're still very useful for uh, the kinds of tasks we want to do. And the key here is that these reduced models are capturing what is essential for the task domain that we're operating. And the question is then, can we create uh, analogous useful model reductions for deformable object manipulation to overcome those very difficult challenges I talked about at the beginning? So uh, the talk will basically consist of two and a little more parts. Um, the first part will be uh, using a uh, set of reduced models, set of simple models for the purposes of control. And what we're going to do here is assume that we're starting somewhat close to where we want to be, maybe not um, very uh, close, but still there's no kind of obstacles in our way, and we need to do something like spread out this cloth on the table, right? Uh, so just as a visual um, notation here, uh, we're always going to be manipulating the green deformable object, and it's always going to be trying to uh, cover up as many of the red points as possible. You'll see many of these kinds of figures uh, in the talk. So here we want to spread the cloth on the table. We're going to talk about how to do some control for that. After that, we're going to look at a different class of problems where we're now actually somewhat far away from the goal, and we may be blocked by an obstacle. And I want to argue that control is not sufficient for doing these kinds of tasks. You need more global planning and reasoning there. So we'll talk about methods to get from the other side of this pole to covering up the table. And then I want to say a little bit about perception at the end of the talk. Uh, even though it's a little bit um, not the same exact topic, but still it's applied to deformable objects. And the reason is that when I submit papers and I get reviews back, one of the most common comments I get is, yeah, all this planning stuff is nice, it has a good control, it makes sense, but how are you ever going to do the perception to make this stuff work? Because all of these things require that you perceive the state of the object. So I'm going to tell you how we're going to do perception and show you some videos. Okay, so... Um, Let's start with the first topic, which is using multiple models for control. Uh, this is the work of my student, Dale McConaughey. He is graduating this year. If people are interested in hiring a very talented student, you should talk to him and me and, and so on. Um, so he started off with this quote, uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And his, his uh, project over the last uh, now four-ish years has been to put this quote into practice for deformable object manipulation. So instead of assuming that we have a set of, uh, uh, sorry, that we have a accurate model, we're going to assume that we have a set of models, some of which may be useful at the current time. We don't know exactly which one, and we don't know which time it will be useful, but we have a set of kind of possibilities for reasonable models for how the object moves. I'll define all this mathematically later on, but right now this is just the intuition. Then what we're going to do is try to estimate the utility of each model as we're doing the task. So we are doing uh, essentially online learning to figure out which model is useful right now. We're going to select a model for the current time step, and then we're going to execute a small velocity command motion uh, for that model. So when we talk about learning which model to use at the current time, the time is very small time step. So it's constantly changing models as it's uh, moving. Uh, and then once we execute a certain command from a given model, uh, sorry, that I should say is optimal for a given model, we're going to update the model utility estimate from the sensor data that we get after executing that command. And something that's unique to our work is that we're also going to infer the utility of similar models that we didn't actually synthesize a command for. Uh, the key to doing this whole thing is to frame this as a multi-arm bandit problem where we're exploiting high utility models, so ones we think are going to be pretty good, uh, with exploration of the other models that we maybe don't have a good estimate of. Now, if you're not familiar with multi-arm bandit problems, I'll, I'll do a quick refresher here. Um, basic idea of multi-arm bandit is that you have a set of actions you can do, and you can do them repeatedly. And your goal is to do the action that gives you the highest reward as much as possible. But the problem is that you don't have a good estimate of the reward probability of each action. So you can think of this as a set of slot machines, and this octopus here is 
pulling the different slot machines. Um, it wants to basically put in money and spend its time on the slot machine that has the highest probability of paying out, right? But it doesn't know which one that is, so he has to kind of explore uh, some of the other ones too. So for instance, uh, if I have a fairly high probability and the variance on that estimate is low, then this is a good uh, action to exploit to get a pretty reliable reward. However, I may have other actions that I may want to do where I get uh, kind of a reasonable reward, but my variance is very high. So I may want to try these, even though they may not yield as much reward as this one, uh, because I want to get a better estimate, because who knows, maybe one of those uh, actions will actually produce a higher uh, probability of reward than the one I already know about. OK, so that's a very abstract formulation. Uh, what does this mean for our problem? To apply the bandit framework to um, any kind of problem, you, you basically have to define what all of these things are for your problem. So for instance, um, we need to know what an arm is. Here, pulling an arm is pulling the arm of a slot machine. In deformable object manipulation, it's going to be uh, which um, model do I use? Uh, what does it mean to pull the arm to, uh, in our case, execute a model action? What's the reward signal? I'll show you that uh, a little bit later. It's basically the utility. So. Um, Here's the outline of this part of the talk. I'll, I'll answer all three of these questions. What's an arm? What does it mean to pull it? What's the reward? And then I'll talk about algorithms that actually solve the multi-arm bandit problem. These two are from prior work um, and make various assumptions on the reward distribution. Uh, this is one that we proposed that uh, takes into account dependence among the arms. Uh, and then I'll show you some uh, simulation and real world experiments. I want to emphasize what's novel in this work is first framing model selection as an MAB problem. We've never seen this before, to my knowledge. And also uh, this new algorithm for dealing with dependent actions. Uh, some assumptions on the sensing here uh, before I get into the actual algorithm. We're going to assume the geometry of everything is known. So we have a sensor. It tells us the geometry of obstacles. It tells us the current uh, state of the, uh, of the uh, deformable object, just in terms of position. And we know where the grippers are. So again, just in terms of visual notation, green object, red points are the target points that we want to cover up with the object. Uh, the gripper is this blue, blue square. OK, and remember that I'll talk more about perception at the end of the talk, so these will probably seem like more reasonable assumptions. Um, OK, so how do we frame this as an MAB problem then? Well, the first question is, what's an arm? In our case, an arm is going to be a model specifically describing what happens when I apply a certain control command in the configuration space of the robot. That's Q. So I want to apply Q dot. It's a small command uh, for the robot to move. And I want to know what the change in the points of the deformable objects is going to be when I apply that command. This is going to be done fairly slowly, so we're assuming the system is quasi-static here. So we're not doing anything like whipping or you know, pulling a tablecloth out from under objects or anything like that. So how are we going to characterize these models, right? Well, they could be a finite element simulator, right? If those are fast enough and we got the right parameters, uh, uh, why not? You know, we could do that there. But in our case, uh, we're just going to do a very simple linear model. Uh, and it's just going to be basically a Jacobian between the degrees of freedom of the robot and the points of the object. Uh, and as I said, we'll have a set of these Jacobians so that um, we have different options for models to use. Uh, what does it then mean to pull an arm? Well, at each time step, we're going to choose a model. And then we're going to generate and execute a velocity command by performing the psi function. And what psi basically does is an optimization. It looks at the uh, Q dot that minimizes the distance between where you are and where you, uh, the direction you want to be going. In, right? uh, so uh, this is also subject to some constraints like velocity, collision, overstretching, and so on that I'm not going to go into details for, but that's all in the paper. OK. Uh, in terms of the reward signal, <clears throat> what we want to do is decrease the task error. That means basically, in our case, the distance between the red dots, the red points we want to cover up, and the points of the deformable object. We want to minimize that as much as possible with every motion. And we get a reward for decreasing that distance. Uh, then the utility of the model is just an expectation over that reward. So what do we expect the reward is going to be? As, of course, you can see, all of this is time dependent. Because as we're moving, the, those distributions of reward are going to be changing. And the models that are going to be more useful are going to be changing. 
Okay. So now that we've set up the MAB problem, how do we solve it? Uh, the first algorithm I'll talk about is a standard one from the literature that everybody benchmarks against. So, of course, we also benchmark against it. It's called UCB1 normal. And it makes a, a key assumption about the distribution of reward that you're getting. The first is that it's stationary, mean, meaning it doesn't change with time. Now, we know that's not true in our case. But what happens if we apply it anyway um, uh, and assume it's stationary? Uh, and it also assumes that each arm, each action is independent. So the reward of uh, pulling arm one and the reward of pulling arm two have nothing to do with each other. That's what it's assuming. And it selects an arm based on the highest, comp uh, the upper confidence bound. So if you look at, let's say you had three arms, and this is the reward distribution for each arm, UCB would pick the higher, uh, highest confidence bound up there, and then it would execute this arm uh, and get a reward for it. And this is a fairly smart strategy because what it's encouraging you to do is to just get the variance down <coughs> of the arms uh, so that you have a good estimate for all of them. Then there was a more recent paper uh, which tried to generalize this uh, kind of thinking to um, uh, a time-varying reward distribution. So now we're assuming that um, the distribution is not stationary, uh, but still we're assuming independence. And the way we're going to deal with the non-stationarity is to use a Kalman filter that tracks the reward distribution over time. And we're also going to use Thompson sampling instead of this UCB approach uh, to pick which arm to use. So uh, again, same situation. Uh, this method is going to take uh, samples from each arm, and it'll pick the uh, arm to execute that has the uh, highest sample. So that one there. Now, our method is a little bit different because, uh, as far as we know, it's the first one to take into account this dependence among the actions. So these actions in these methods are assumed to be completely independent. They have nothing to do with each other. But in our method, we can take a joint sample by considering correlations between uh, the commands the arms are uh, producing, which I'll talk about more in the next slide. Uh, but we can basically take into account this dependence. We still use a Kalman filter. We still use Thompson sampling. But um, in practice, we do get lower regret uh, than these other methods. So there's one Kalman filter for each model? That's right, exactly, yes. Um, OK, so uh, to define uh, this uh, um, uh, problem, we also need to uh, consider the process dynamics. So basically, if I have some expected decrease in task error, say that was the decrease in task error from my last time step of execution, and I don't use that model again, meaning I ignore that model, what happens to its reward distribution? If I just leave it as it is, that's actually not a good idea because um, I'm, I'm not uh, confident that that model will retain its utility across time. I want to get more uncertain about the utility of the model the less I use it. Okay? And so that's what we've added these uh, dynamics for. We're basically adding uh, Gaussian uh, noise to uh, this estimate so that the variance uh, grows. Uh, and then the key question is, how do we correlate model utility? Well, to do this, we're going to look at the similarity between the actions that the models think are optimal. So let's say I have model I and model J. Model I says, go this way with this blue arrow. Model J says, go this way with this uh, yellow arrow. Um, and those are both optimal under their respective models. And for some reason, I pick model I. And I get some reward. Now, since model I's action and model J's action are actually very close together spatially, we're going to make an assumption that the reward will also uh, be close, uh, meaning that I should expect to see a similar reward for model J as model I. And in uh, cases where the actions are very different from each other, we would expect not uh, for, that to be, for that not to be the case, right? We don't want to correlate the reward of this model with the reward of this one that we haven't actually executed. And so that's what we do. We, we look at the dot product between those vectors, and we measure um, how much to apply the reward uh, that we got from model I to model J. OK, so in terms of uh, experiments, we first start with simulation experiments. And here, there are two tasks that we're looking at. One is to wind a rope around the cylinder uh, like this. Uh, I used to motivate this with uh, surgical uh, suturing applications where you wrap the suture around one arm before uh, kind of uh, uh, picking up the, the rest with the other to tie a knot. 
Uh, but I talked to Max uh, this morning, and he said, you don't need to do that anymore. Uh, because now there's this like suturing machine that can do it with one arm. So anyway, it's just wrapping a rope around the cylinder. Uh, this one is um, uh, basically feeding a cloth onto a roller, like you might need to do in uh, textiles manufacturing, for instance. Uh, we're going to use the bullet simulator as a black box for evaluation in this. I, I really want to make this clear. We are not in any way using the parameters of the models in the bullet simulator uh, to pick which action to use. The bullet simulator is basically a stand-in for the real world. It provides us with perception data and it allows us to execute actions. So the questions we want to ask here are which method completes the task and how fast uh, does it do so? And um, which MAB method is actually better at minimizing regret? Because this is a key metric for these multi-arm gambit problems. So here's an example of winding a rope around the cylinder. Over here you see just using a single model, and over here you see our method with the MAB. And you can see a histogram of which models it's picking from a set of 60. They're just 60 Jacobians with different parameters in them. And um, you can see that basically uh, we're picking a, a bunch of different ones, uh, whereas here we're stuck in one model. Right? And the, this first model, uh, this one model, did actually really well at the beginning, but then it diverged towards the end, whereas this continues to uh, have good performance um, until it wraps the whole cylinder around. And if we look at this in uh, terms of the data here, we see that when we're executing just a single model, we could get lucky or we could get unlucky. And we don't even know when to evaluate that luck. It's very difficult, right? So these thin lines are just individual Jacobian-based models, uh, and these thicker lines are the MAB methods. All the MAB methods work well for this uh, example. And the single ones are interesting because if you look at these single model runs here, you can see they're actually outperforming the MAB methods. They're going faster uh, and achieving less error, which is great, right? Except that when they get here, there's a problem, and somehow they, off, uh, they go off and diverge, okay? And this is really the benefit of the MAB methods. Because it's not locked in to just using one model, even if it was performing well at the beginning, they have a chance to switch to something if the current model they're using is not working. And we also see on this plot here that the um, regret from our MAB method is indeed better than the other's regret, although in this particular case, regret doesn't make much of a difference in this application. Here's another example. This is feeding that cloth under the cylinder. This is comparing the previous uh, MAB method with ours. This one has no accounting for correlations between models, and ours does. And uh, this one actually gets stuck here. For a long time, it has to try many different models uh, because it's often trying models that produce exactly the same result. They don't go anywhere, and it can't learn from that. Whereas this one is able to learn that faster because it knows about the correlation between these models. So if we take a look at these results, we see in red our proposed method uh, that it does uh, actually uh, converge to the goal faster on average. Um, you can see there was one run where we had a problem with the simulator and the cloth actually went through the object. This is, again, why uh, simulating these things at high precision is, is very difficult. Um, and you see our method is uh, outperforming uh, the, the other methods here. UCB1 is competitive. Uh, because it's doing something very stupid. It's just trying every single model in order to reduce the variance. That's its initial phase. And um, it turns out that works well for this case because, uh, at least in this application, what's more important is not picking the single best model. What's more important is just avoiding the bad ones. And then you can pick between the decent ones kind of uh, reasonably uh, evenly. Uh, in yeah. bullet simulator, mm -hmm. the Physics is included for the um, yeah, so it's doing FEM. Order, right, but yeah. In, but to, uh, keeping no, uh, track of just the Q dot, which is a manipulator uh, variable, variable yeah. uh, is that enough to supply the driving input to the simulator? because I'm not seeing any forces. Forces. Right, exactly. So uh, I didn't want to get too into the details, but it's a very good question. Um, you can't uh, just simulate positions, right? You need forces, you need torques. So under the hood of all of this, there's like a bullet controller that's telling uh, how much um, to move uh, one of those. When I say you apply a Q dot, it actually creates the motion. And then there are anchors between the rigid body of the gripper 
and the cloth itself, which act basically as springs. So in effect, what Bullet is doing is it's pulling these uh, cloth along with a spring in there. But I've kind of skipped over that the talk, yeah. So how small are these time steps that you're talking about? And does that actually affect performance? Great question. So uh, because we're in a simulation world, we can pick the size of our simulation step. I don't remember exactly what my student was using here, but it was fairly small. I mean, I want to say on the order of like point one, point oh 0.01 seconds, but I, I'd have to look at the paper for the exact number. Uh, but this is how long it actually takes to, you know, do the entire task. So, you know, our methods here converge about seven seconds or eight seconds or so. If your time step is a very big issue, you yeah. make it too big, you have a stability problem, and you might collide. Right. So it has to be small. Otherwise, simulation may not convert. Yeah, and I think, thanks to, you know, this is exactly one of the problems you see here. Uh, yeah. Are the correlations changing over time since it's a function of the optimal action? Absolutely, exactly. So at every time step, we actually compute all of the optimal actions for all the models, which isn't super expensive because they're all linear, but still, you know, it requires a little time. And then at every time step, we see what the correlations are. And so they're always changing. Yeah. Uh, at any given time step, you're only taking one action, right? That's right. So in your IJ divergence diagram that you showed, how are you knowing the estimated position of J if you haven't taken that action. At that time. Right, so, so if we solve the optimal control problem for each arm, right, we can do that, um, and we execute just one of them, we'll know, first of all, the target gripper position for each one, and we'll know the reward for the one we execute. So if we just correlate based on the target gripper position, which we're assuming we can always get to because, you know, it's our robot, we can just move it there, then we know the, those vectors that I showed on the slide. Okay, so um, what about computation time? Again, we want this to be a controller. Is it fast enough? I think it's almost there, but, but not quite. Um, so uh, if we are doing things for the rope, it's a much simpler object. There's much fewer points to consider. So we get a 0.01 second computation time for these methods that just use one uh, model evaluation. But if we evaluate all 60 Jacobians uh, for their optimal actions, then we uh, get you know, 0.2 seconds, so a little bit slow. Uh, cloth, obviously m many more points, and here is the number of points, so you have 6,000 points on the cloth, um, and uh, you know, things are going to slow down. So here uh, we get an order of magnitude slowdown, here we get uh, maybe double slowdown. But it's getting there, and I think with parallelization uh, we could make this even faster. Here's an example of doing this in the real world. I'm totally cheating on perception. And I promise to address that at the end of the talk. Uh, but here are the fiducials uh, that uh, we actually track as points on the object. Uh, it's constantly uh, evaluating its controllers, switching between controllers as it's executing. The goal is to bring this uh, cloth into this uh, box here. You can see it's not just uh, treating the cloth as a, a rigid body, right? It was hanging over the side of the table. Now it's changed shape. Uh, it's flexing a little bit. And, um, the robot's able to handle this. Actually, one of the hardest parts of setting up these experiments is actually working with the robot's workspace to make sure it has enough range to actually uh, do what you want to do um, because it can get stuck otherwise. So now it's reached the goal, uh, and uh, it'll stop. Okay. Okay, so that was uh, some local control approaches, and there are more videos I can show you of other kind of local control applications. But uh, I'm actually interested in where this fails. Right? So in a case where we're close to the goal, we're OK. But what about when we start on the other side of an obstacle like this? The controllers that I showed you, being very simple methods, are not going to know how to get around that obstacle. To do that, we require some kind of global reasoning. We, we have to think about geometry and collision-free paths. And what does that mean? It means motion planning. Okay, so we need a planner to be able to uh, deal with these situations. So that's the second part of the talk. How do we use a planner when we need to get around obstacles and use a controller to actually complete the task? And how do we interleave those in a kind of general purpose way? So again, this is the work of Dale and a recent graduated master's student, Meng Yao. And in this work, they wanted to answer some key questions. Um, and one of the first questions that we said was, well, why do we need control at all? Why don't I just write a motion planner that gets me from start to goal? I mean, that's what we do with rigid objects all the time. Why can't we do that in this case? 
And the answer is that we don't have a good model of the object. So we need online feedback to precisely position it. We can get the object roughly into some area if we just think about where the grippers are going. But if we want to precisely position it, position it nice and flat on the table, then we're going to need a controller. So we have to have control in there at some point because we need the online feedback. So then how are we going to interleave planning and control? Well, our idea is that the planner should get us close to the goal, and then the controller should finish the task if possible. When should we then use the planner? Well, if we predict that the controller is going to be stuck by kind of forward simulating the controller a little bit, uh, then we're going to trigger the planner. So we're only going to use planning in cases where we think the controller is doomed. Okay, so let's formulate the planning problem then. Um, the goal is going to be to move the grippers somewhere into the target region. And we're going to define this as kind of the centroids of two clusters in the target region because we have two grippers. Uh, the target region is, of course, defined by the red points here. So at the end of the day, what we want the planner to output is a path like this. We don't really care that much about the state of the cloth as long as it doesn't get caught on anything. Uh, we just want to get the grippers into this area and the cloth into this area so that we can um, spread the cloth out on the table with our control. Okay? So the planning uh, is going to be done in the space of gripper translations. That's the actual control space that we're uh, going to be assuming for the planner. I already told you about the goal configurations being just areas in the target region. And what's most important is we have no idea what the target cloth configuration should be. We just know we shouldn't get it caught on anything. And that brings us to the constraints. Of course, we want to avoid the gripper collisions. But most importantly, we don't want to overstretch the object, meaning we don't want to catch it on something and tear it by overextending it. And this is actually a very tricky constraint here. Right? Because think about the space of actions that I'm looking at and the fact that I don't have a good simulation of this cloth. I don't know when this will happen. Right? So how are we going to deal with that? Well, to frame the problem, um, think about a standard kinodynamic planning algorithm. And I know some of you aren't motion planning people, so I'll kind of step through this. Those of you who are familiar with this, uh, sorry if um, it's a little bit boring, but need to set this up. So um, we have this kinodynamic planning template. And there are many different algorithms that fall into this template. And it looks something like this. You create a set of nodes. You pick a node on, let's say you have a tree. This is just one example of how this could work. It could be a graph in general. But here, let's say it's a tree. We pick a node through some process. In an RT, we sample a random uh, state and then find the nearest neighbor. But you could pick a node uh, in another way. Then we pick some action A. And then we simulate that action A to get some state X prime. Right? This is the standard motion planning template. Unfortunately, this is the part that we can't do very well in our application because we don't have a good model of the object. And even if we did, we'd have to pay a lot of time cost for simulating that. So we'd like to avoid that if we can. So how do we avoid that? Well, look at the next line of the algorithm right here. If x prime meets constraints, blah, 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 you know, add it to the tree and keep planning, right? This is really what's important. We don't really care so much about that state as long as it meets the constraints and as long as we can eventually check that uh, if this state is a goal state, OK? So the exact true state doesn't matter that much. What matters is the constraints and the goal test. So how then can we avoid doing physics simulation to generate that x prime? Well, as I said before, what matters is obeying the constraints. So uh, we want to apply the following insight. We don't need to know the full geometric state of the object to check the constraints. Of course, it's sufficient to check the constraints, but it may not be necessary. So instead, what we want to do is forward propagate an approximation or model reduction of the relevant part of the object without doing physics simulation, right? Or we could say we're doing minimal simulation so that we can satisfy the constraints that we care about. And here's a specific example for this no tearing the cloth constraint. For this particular constraint, it does not matter how the cloth is draping on the floor and the beautiful wrinkles in the cloth and all that that make it wonderful for graphics applications. All we care about is that the geodesic between the grippers doesn't get too long. Because if it does, then the grippers are going to tear the cloth apart. Right? So that's what we want to keep track of. We want to keep track of this geodesic. But how are we going to forward propagate? 
And that's the next slide. I, I, I want to mention one other thing about this. This kind of model reduction is only possible because the object will naturally comply to obstacles, right? If the object was rigid, we couldn't do this. We would have to care about where every single point on that object was. But because it's deformable, we don't need to care about those things. What about, you worry about stiffness? So, they're deformable and then they're deformable. Uh, that's right. So there's no such thing as a rigid object. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, every object will deform under enough force, right? So here we're assuming that the force provided by the grippers is sufficient that it could tear the object if you commanded it wrong. Um, but it's, um, it, it can be smaller than that as well. Yeah. And we're assuming that the compliance here um, is such that, you know, basically any kind of passive deformation, meaning that I'm not actively trying to compress it, but just passively letting it hang, is not going to damage the object. So it is restrictive in that it's not going to apply to things like, uh, you know, surgical tissue or, or uh, human tissue or anything like that. Uh, mostly things that are very compliant, like cloth or rope. Um, OK, so uh, now that we know we want to check the constraints and we want to forward propagate this geodesic, how do we do it? Uh, and how do we do it efficiently? Well, it turns out that we can treat this geodesic kind of like an elastic band, right? So we can imagine that that elastic band will tighten to the uh, shortest possible length um, between the grippers, given the obstacles. And uh, our method for doing that tightening is actually based on something from Sean Quinlan's thesis in 1994, which is one of the first things I read as a grad student. It's really great. If you're interested in motion planning, this is a really great read. Um, so um, let's uh, see how this works. So in the configuration space, which is the space of the robot's degrees of freedom in this case, uh, we have, uh, uh, we're starting at a point here, and we're starting from some initial state of the cloth, which we know because we've perceived it, and here's our geodesic between the grippers, which we just compute as the shortest path through the cloth from one gripper to another. Now I want to do some motion. So I want to move these grippers somewhere. That's going to be some motion in C space like this. And I want to know what happens to this geodesic when I do this motion, right? So now I lose the state of the deformable object because I don't know what it will be after I do this motion. And I forward propagate this geodesic by looking at the distances between points on it and the nearest obstacles and the grippers. And I basically tighten it up as much as I can so that it uh, sticks to that obstacle like a rubber band. Okay, so this is somewhat fast to simulate. It's just geometric computation. There's no friction involved and so on. Um, and it gives us something like this, where we're kind of snapped around the obstacle. And then we continue planning. We continue trying more motions and exploring the space uh, using this uh, kind of propagation. So that's how we do uh, some of the planning. Um, how do we integrate this with the control method that I talked about before? Well, before I talked about a local controller that basically executed commands and then checked if it was done. If it was done, it stopped, right? So that was the kind of simple control loop. Now we have a planner. When do we trigger the planner? Well, we're going to predict if the local controller is going to get stuck. Uh, we could just wait for it to get stuck and wait to get to that stretching limit or feel some force limit, but that's going to be kind of stupid because the, the grippers are going to already have wrapped around the obstacle before uh, they're going to trigger that they're stuck. So instead, we, we do a simple prediction of where the controller is going to go into the future, and we see if any of those geodesics will get stuck for the controller. If they do get stuck, then we're going to invoke the planner. It's going to generate a path. And then we're going to execute this path. So this is the path execution loop. And until we're done with the path or we get st stuck, which could still happen, and I'll tell you why later, uh, we're going to keep executing. And uh, if we're not at the goal when we're finished, then uh, we switch back to the local controller, which again may get stuck and again would trigger the planner. So it's basically trading off uh, the planning and control based on when the controller gets stuck. Uh, one more note about the planning, though, because this is important um, to actually reach a specific target uh, point set, we may need to think about the homotopy class that we end up in. Because we're planning in just the space of the grippers, uh, we may put the band on the wrong side of the obstacle, and the controller won't be able to complete the task, even though we've gotten the grippers where we want them to go. So this is actually very hard, because we don't know the right homotopy class to be in to complete the task. Um, we don't know which side of the obstacle we're supposed to be on uh, for the controller to converge. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to go 
uh, to s the target position. We're going to end up in some homotopy class. We're going to run the controller through that framework I showed. If we get to the goal, great. If we don't, then we know that was the wrong homotopy class. And we're going to blacklist that previously visited homotopy class, and then we're going to replan, and we're going to make sure we don't end up in the same class. We're going to find a different class. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Um, and this is very uh, useful because uh, we don't want the planner to repeat the same mistake. And um, the way we do the homotopy class check is uh, using a first-order homotopy a uh, pretty well-established method from the literature. It's not the true homotopy, but it's a fast approximation. OK, so when you create a sampling-based planner like this, it can be tempting to just kind of make something, and it runs, and you get some nice videos, and that's good. I, I mean, that's useful. But we also wanted to show some theoretical properties. And one of the most important ones is called probabilistic completeness. Uh, and basically says that if you give me a problem that's solvable, I have to know it's solvable, and you give me enough time, I will find a solution. This is the most important property to prove for these sampling-based methods. And does that apply here? Well, let's see. Um, usually, these proofs rely on the expansiveness of the space. And this is kind of fundamental uh, all, all the way back to like the PRM proofs uh, in the early days. Right? So we have to assume that around every state, there's a maybe just really tiny bubble of free space so that I can perturb that state a little bit, and I'll still be OK. Right? Um, and usually, this is a kind of no-brainer for rigid body manipulation. You don't even have to worry about it. Okay? But is this true when we use this elastic band representation of the object? Let's find out. So, the configuration space of the entire system, not just the grippers we're planning for, is now going to be R6, so just the positions of the grippers. Uh, and then B here represents the configuration space of the elastic band, which can be represented as a set of ordered points. Um, we have a very highly underactuated system, so there's no steering function. We can't servo to a specific state of the band. Um, so our proof doesn't assume that, like many uh, completeness proofs. Um, and um, what's really the big problem, though, is that we cannot assume expansiveness, that property that there's a little bit of free space uh, in any direction around a given state. Right? So uh, if you look at just the gripper part of the C space, so just R6, then we can have expansiveness. Right? We can pick a point, and we can uh, perturb it around. And as long as it's not touching an obstacle, we're OK. And all the completeness stuff works there, no problem. The big problem is the band part of the space. So this is an example where the band is kind of hooked around an obstacle. Now, if I look at a point here, there's no way I can perturb it down into the obstacle. So I lose that expansiveness property. Okay? Uh, and so what we were able to do is actually take advantage of deformable compliance to get away with not having expansiveness. So first, we already have expansiveness in the uh, one part of the C space, the part with the grippers in it. So we don't need to worry about that part. Uh, for the band space, we can actually take advantage of the fact that the band complies up to a certain stretching limit. So that when we perturb the robot trajectory, it does not cause the band to overstretch in the workspace as long as we're epsilon away from the stretching limit. Uh, though I put this as like one simple sentence on the side, this took about two pages of math to actually prove, which I'm sparing you here but um, I can show you in the paper if, if you're interested later. Once we define this, um, we can actually follow a proof uh, from previous work on stable sparse trees to actually um, prove that we do have probabilistic completeness. So uh, as far as I know, this is the first probabilistic completeness proof for a system of this kind, where you have this def deformable compliance uh, in the workspace. OK, a few experiments to show you that um, this is actually practical. Uh, so again, bullet is a black box. We don't know anything about how the simulator is generating uh, the states. Uh, and the uh, controller that we're using uh, is going to just use a single um, Jacobian. Uh, that's because we didn't want to muddle the results of the Jacobian uh, choosing stuff with the uh, planning uh, things that you see here. And we use a 10 time step forward looking for the stuck prediction. So here uh, is the video. So as you see here, these, bla uh, these blue boxes correspond to where we predict the grippers will be when we're executing. We tried to execute the controller. We thought we're going to get stuck, so we switched to the planner. And all that stuff flying around there, that's the planner exploring different configurations. Now it optimized a path to get from here to 
uh, uh, on the table, and now it's executing that path. What you see in black here are the predictions of that elastic band as we're executing, because we're always getting new information about the state uh, when we're executing. And if they're black, it means that no problem. Uh, we are not going to overstretch the object. Now we've gotten to the goal configuration for the grippers, and now what you see is the controller taking over. And you see the forward predictions of the controller. Again, no overstretching. Uh, the grippers are going to the right place. And the object gets nice and smoothed out on the table. OK. Uh, but this is a fairly easy planning problem. They're just a big pole. Just go to the side of the pole. What's the big deal, right? Um, so I wanted to show that the planner really is versatile, right? So one of the problems with sampling-based planning is narrow passages. So does this work in a narrow passage, or did we make that harder for some reason? No, it turns out we can plan quite quickly in these cases, too. Again, uh, we're trying to get the cloth to cover up this table. You just saw how fast the planner went. Now we're optimizing the path, making it smoother and shorter. And now we're going to execute, and you're going to see the grippers basically follow these uh, paths to get to the goal. So I'm just going to skip ahead here for the interest of time. It, it gets to the table, it executes the controller, and it gets there. But you know, even this is okay. Well, it was a kind of a small block before. Now it's a big block. Can you do something really complicated? So he said, Yeah, let's make up a maze. And in this maze, we have two layers. There's a bottom layer which has obstacles in purple, and a top layer which has obstacles in green. The rope starts on the bottom layer and has to get over here in the top layer. And the way to get between the bottom and the top is through these two holes down here. So here you see the planner has been launched because we instantly saw that the controller is not going to succeed. And now we're executing. This is really sped up because it's such a large environment. And you can see that it's doing a very long-term manipulation. And it is uh, not catching the rope on any of the obstacles, right? Because it, it was doing that um, uh, elastic band. Uh, prediction. Uh, so anyway, it, it continues to go, and it uh, eventually gets to uh, the goal for the grippers, and then we launch the controller, and the controller uh, takes it all the way uh, towards the end. Okay. Okay. In terms of computation time, uh, we're doing pretty well. Uh, so the control times are, are shown here. This is per iteration of the controller. Uh, the planning times are also not bad. Uh, I, I want it to be faster, but it's still pretty good. Uh, so we have about on the order of 3 to 10 seconds, uh, depending largely on the size of the environment for the planning time. Uh, and um, uh, same for the smoothing time, about 2.5 to 12 seconds. And what dominates the planning is, of course, the band propagation, right? So the simulation or the propagation of that band is time consuming. If this was a full-blown physics simulator, these numbers would be way, way higher. Um, now, remember I told you about these problems with homotopy, that we don't know the homotopy class we want a priori. Well, here's how that can play out. Let's say, again, I want to uh, cover these red points with the green points. I'm simulating uh, the forward prediction of these um, grippers into the future. And I found some plan that uh, you know, might, uh, uh, actually, I'm executing a, a controller that might bring the grippers towards the target. But the controller got stuck. Uh, so now I'm going to do a plan. OK, great. I'm going to do some planning here. Uh, and I'm going to get the grippers to the right place. OK, here we go. So I got the grippers right to the red dots, so everything should be good, right? Well, no, because I somehow ended up in the wrong homotopy class for this rope. The rope should be on the other side of the obstacle. So what am I going to do? I'm going to blacklist this homotopy class. I'm going to say, don't repeat that mistake. And I'm going to plan again, OK? So I start planning. And what you see here is a lot more planning than you saw in the previous examples. It has to do. A lot more planning because it has to figure out how to get out of this homotopy class when it's almost at the stretching limit, and then how to then complete the task. And that's what it finds out how to do. It figures out to unwrap around this obstacle and then uh, get to the uh, target there. And then again, we switch to the controller, and we can finish the task. Um, OK. So um, there are some limitations to this planner. As I said, we use the model reduction. There are going to be things we can't do and things we haven't accounted for. So for instance, we don't account for the slack of the object. So 
uh, if I use this elastic band representation, it'll snap tight in free space, and I can pass that band over a hook, but the actual slack part of the object will get caught under the hook like this. So this can happen with this representation. Also, um, if you, you uh, allow rotations and complex motions like that, uh, you uh, can get the cloth to be twisted. That's not captured by this representation either. So, okay, what are we going to do about this? Do we just kind of punt on these things? Well, no. Um, in fact, in a recent paper to RAL that we just submitted, <laughs> we are actually learning to predict when this model is going to give us bad results. And the idea of doing this is that when we're planning, we can avoid the actions that we think the model is unreliable for in the planner uh, and maybe take an alternate route. In this case, we could say, okay, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, I'll get stuck or not when I move this close to this hook. Why don't I just go really high up above the hook and make sure that I don't get caught? Uh, so that was the planning and control. And then um, I want to zoom out a little bit and say what matters for these deformable object manipulation tasks. And we use different models. We use different models reduction, reductions for each of these. But the important thing is that we didn't focus on getting the most accurate model. We focused on getting a model that was fast to compute and that gave reasonable predictions in uh, a large set of important tasks. And then, as I kept promising, what about perception? So I'll do a real quick summary of uh, very recent work on perception, which is coming out at IROS in a uh, few months. So why do we care about this? <coughs> All of the stuff that I showed you before relies on an accurate estimate of where the object is. If we don't know where the object is, we can't do planning or control. What's the state of the art? Well, um, there's disagreement, of course, but uh, one of the most commonly used methods is called coherent point drift. It's a Gaussian mixture model-based method. Uh, uh, that uses an EM loop to track the points of a deformable object as it moves. And here's how this standard method works, right? So we have a rope, we, we're tracking these points on the rope, and as you can see, when my student moves his hand in front of the rope, you see these jumps that are happening in the points? That's happening because there are occlusions, and they can get really bad to the point that the whole estimate gets mangled like this. And this is really a key challenge for deformable object manipulation because, uh, again, we're not assuming we have cameras everywhere in the environment. We may have just one camera, and we may not be able to see the whole object, especially if we're folding it up. Right? So how are we going to do tracking in these cases? Uh, that's really the challenge, and that's the core of the method that we developed. Uh, this is the work of Cheng Chi, who is an undergraduate who is graduating this year, and he's looking for opportunities. So, uh, you know, another excellent student. Um, so this method is basically a combination of the original CPD with local linear embedding. It's using depth information to augment the prior of the Gaussians that we use for a, um, occluded points. And it's also doing post-processing to preserve distance constraints so that points don't just kind of uh, drift away or get too separated. And the result is, as you see, he's moving the box over here. The points stay where they are. They don't fly off the object like you saw in the previous video. We also add a component that uh, recovers uh, from tracking failure, which will definitely happen if you have a lot of folding, no matter what you use. But it's able to recover by using a library of previous uh, frames and the templates for those. And the nice feature is we actually don't need to know the physics of this uh, method, uh, of this object, in order to do this. So here's a comparison between our method and some benchmarks. This is the original CPD. This was a more recent work that combines CPD with physics estimation. And, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with these. It's just that they don't consider occlusion, right? And so uh, by considering occlusion, we can better estimate uh, the state of the object and avoid these correspondence mismatches that can really corrupt the estimate for the remainder of the tracking. Uh, here's an example with the box. And... Um, one more example coming up here with the robot. Uh, so here, this is really important. When we fold the cloth over, right, if we get the correspondences wrong, that could be a big problem. But since we know where uh, we're gripping uh, the object, uh, we can incorporate that into our framework and um, not get the correspondences wrong. This is an example of the failure recovery. Um, so here we folded the object over. Uh, we basically are not tracking well at this point. Now we're going to unfold it, and using our previous experience, we, we know how uh, to initialize the tracker, whereas without the failure recovery, you see um, there, there's not as good of an estimate. Okay, and here, this is the final video. This is the last thing I'll show. Um, 
is an example where the robot is uh, basically manipulating the object with everything in a, in a full closed loop system. So we have perception, we're tracking the state of this object, no cheating fiducials here, just uh, a connect image. Uh, so we're tracking uh, these points on the object. We've planned a path to get this object around an obstacle that you see there. Uh, we've told it it can't just go over because it'll knock the obstacle over. Um, and uh, now we are <coughs> completing the task by uh, basically moving this uh, uh, cloth into the target region in front of the robot. Um, what I want to say about this, um, the planning is a little bit slow. You might have seen at the beginning there. This is not because of the deformable objects uh, motion planning part. This is actually because of the kinematics of the robot. It has a somewhat limited workspace, and it was right on the boundary of it. So it takes it a long time to uh, find a path. But anyway, it finds a path, and it's able to reach the target. Uh, and uh, once it does, it will uh, engage the controller, uh, like you see right here. And you can see there's some deformation around that peg. But in the end, it places the uh, object in the target region. OK, uh, in terms of future work, I think there's a lot of interesting directions. Can we automatically come up with these model reductions? Can we automatically describe the set of tasks that a model, model reduction will work for uh, instead of just uh, kind of doing it from our intuition? I think these are really important questions for future work that we're excited about tackling. So with that, I'd like to say thanks for your attention. And uh, thank you to my uh, wonderful students who did all the work that you saw today. Uh, and also thank you to our sponsors uh, for supporting this research. Thanks. Any questions? No question. Yeah. So have you thought at all about task selection that might help resolve amb ambiguities in the estimation? Yeah, so, uh, so if I understand correctly, it's when uh, I'm able to choose what action to do for information gathering purposes. Yeah. So um, in a sense, that's kind of folded into the multi-arm bandit uh, framework because it's trying to explore as well as exploit the high utility model. So if there's an ambiguity there, it's kind of biased to not, that not let that ambiguity grow too large before it tries to address it. But you could also incorporate kind of more manual, like, Let's try this um, by just looking at the properties of the set of models you have. But we, we haven't done that. Other questions? Yeah? So how do you generate your models for the multi-arm bandit? Is there some like, number of models that you need to fill the space? Yeah, yeah. So that's a great question. So let, let me just address this idea of covering the space of models. So um, the cloth we had in the multi-arm band case had 6,000 nodes. The gripper, uh, let's say we just have three degrees of freedom for the gripper, for simplicity. Right, so I have a matrix of three uh, by 6,000, uh, so 6,000 times three, so 18,000 times three. Right? That's how many numbers I need to put in that Jacobian. If we were trying to cover that space, we would need, I don't know, billions of models or some ridiculous number. We don't even try to do that. Uh, what we do is um, build Jacobians based on two methods. One is, I, I showed the references earlier, but uh, one of them is uh, assuming a diminishing rigidity model, which is something that we created that assumes a kind of simple linear relationship between the grippers and the uh, cloth. And basically, the further, uh, the closer you are to the grippers, the more the object moves rigidly, the farther away, the less of that motion there is. So it's like a simple heuristic, basically. Uh, then there are also adaptive Jacobian methods, like uh, from David Navarro Alacran's group, where uh, what they're doing is basically starting with some guess of a Jacobian, maybe even identity. And then um, as they move, they get sensor updates, and they just tweak that uh, Jacobian to account for what they saw at the previous time step. So that's how those Jacobian models were generated. But we have no hope of covering the model space. Uh, so we don't even try to do that. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, wait. Yes. Can we like, uh, attach these markers on the cloth so that you can find out if it is slack or not? The cloth? Uh, of course, yes. Yeah. So that's what you saw with the fiducials in one of the earlier videos. Um, but uh, I think what's really important is to understand what the planner knows 
view versus what the controller knows. So the controller is moving and getting sensor update. Move, get sensor update. Move. So there we can put fiducials, we can do all the slack stuff, no problem. The planner gets one state, and then it has to predict what the state of the cloth will be with using no sensor information up until you get to the goal. So there, markers won't help you because the planner can't know the state once you're executing the path within the planner. Does that make sense? Uh, like I didn't get the second part. So, so the planner doesn't get sensor feedback right, during planning. It's just saying, OK, given this is my start state and my internal representation of how the object moves, what's going to happen? But it gets no sensor feedback while it's doing it. OK? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your band only assumes like the top edge for your planning, and then you apply your constraints to that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And you say that you don't go over the top of the obstacle because you don't want it to collide or knock the obstacle over? Uh, for, uh, okay, in that last yeah, video, yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the same time, your final plan, the cloth did touch the obstacle. Yeah, yeah, so touching the obstacle is okay. So first of all, um, we don't want to just go over top of the obstacle for a demo reason, which is it's too easy. Right? I mean, it's really easy to just go like this. Right? So we wanted to create a more complicated situation where we wanted to have uh, the robot actually make significant motion to avoid the obstacle and have significant deformation. So that's really why we did it. But you know, there's a practical application to this, too. If you're trying to set a table right, uh, and you have a placemat, you don't want to drag it over you know, what's on the table, uh, including your salt and your food and, and all that. Manually disabled, or have you manually added constraints that it doesn't go over? Yeah, we, we basically did that for that example uh, by just limiting how high the grippers can go. Hey, um, before I forget, I wanted to thank Lockheed Martin for sponsoring the series. They're a very important part of this. And I want to thank again um, Dr. Berenson for his lovely talk. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.